If there's a vegetable that I enjoy eating, I'm determined to learn how to grow it. Yeah, even if it's not one that traditionally grows in our part of the world, or under our climate conditions, or in our soil, it's so much fun to give it a try. I'm Barbara Damrod. I'm Elliot Coleman. Stay with us for the next half hour, and we'll show you how we've added a lot of unusual vegetables to our gardening repertoire, some of them you may never even have heard of. On Gardening Naturally. I'm a great fan of the nothing is impossible philosophy. Ever since I first read that bananas are grown commercially in Iceland using heat from geothermal springs, I thought, wow, if we use our ingenuity, there's nothing we can't do in the garden. Often we don't grow a certain vegetable just because we've been told that we can't in our climate. But when you think of it, all the common garden vegetables that we do grow originated in some distant part of the planet, and somebody figured out how to grow them here. And we figured out how to grow watercress without a stream, how to grow sweet potatoes in our far northern climate, and how to grow globe artichokes in an area where the plants can't survive the winter. My fascination with unusual vegetables began about 25 years ago when I heard that I couldn't grow globe artichokes. I was told that since they're a perennial that don't produce the first summer and aren't hardy enough to make it through our New England winter, that I'd never be able to get them. Well, I always take horticultural challenges seriously. If someone tells me something's impossible, I go right out and buy a packet of seed, which I did. And also, I love to eat globe artichokes. I planted the seed as early as I could, figuring that might help, and was very surprised that that first summer, half of the plants I put out produced globe artichokes in the first summer. So I thought back, now what have I done here? Well, I had two flats of them, and oh yeah, there wasn't enough room in the warm greenhouse for one of them, and I'd moved it out early to a cold frame. And lo and behold, those were the ones that it produced. So I thought back, I looked in the literature, and I found out exactly what I had done. A simple biological system called vernalization. In other words, I had tricked the plants into thinking they were older than they really were. And this is how I now do it. I plant as early as I can, about six weeks before it's safe to put the plants in a cold frame, and I don't want the temperature in the cold frame to go below 25. So they have six weeks in the warmth of the house or a greenhouse, then they go out to the cold frame, spend the next six weeks in that cold frame as cool as I can keep it without freezing them. Now what happens is they think that first warm six weeks is their first summer. They think the next cool six weeks is their first winter, and lo and behold, after 12 weeks when they're ready to go in the garden, they think they're two years old and are ready to produce. Now, when I plant them, I plant them in soil blocks, just like this. And when they're big enough, have enough growth on, I move them to a larger soil block. And so I eventually get a plant about this size. And that's the system I've used for years, but things have changed. People have gotten interested in annual artichokes, and now varieties like this one called Imperial Star that have been bred to actually be an annual. Well, I never trust these things right off, so this year I'm doing a trial. I've made four plantings, one as early as normal, one a month later, one a month after that, and this one, which is just coming up now. And I'm gonna see just how dependably annual these are. And later on, we'll show you which of these worked. Now, when I'm ready to put them in the ground, a number of things I know about artichokes. They like a very fertile soil, so I put in plenty of compost. In fact, if you've grown a green manure the year before, so much the better. And the other thing is, in the climates where they thrive, which are cool and moist, they get conditions that make them grow the best. How do I duplicate cool and moist? Well, plenty of compost in the soil and mulch around the plants this is straw, you could use hay, once I plant them, and plenty of irrigation. I do my best to give them the conditions they like, and they give me bounteous crops every year of annual artichokes. What's my next challenge? Golly, I may not try pineapples just yet, 
But there are other warm crops, one in particular, that don't normally grow in this climate that we've had some pretty good luck with. The best authority I know on unusual edibles is this book, first published in 1919, Sturdivant's Edible Plants of the World. And it lists everything you've heard of and many, many that you never even knew existed. We're always experimenting with interesting salad greens, for instance. This one is called Claytonia. Another common name for it is miner's lettuce because it's a California weed. The Latin name is Montia perfoliata. And this will turn into a nice bushy clump even with little white flowers in the center. And it's very mild and tasty in salads. Right, and another mild, tasty salad green is mosh, that's the French name for it, or corn salad in English. And it has leaves about the size of your thumb. It's a small plant, but it is the hardiest plant known and will grow and provide you with greens all winter in a cold frame. That's right. Or if you want a little bitey green, here's one you might not have tried that we just love, arugula. Very easy to grow and wonderful. You only want to pep up a salad. And another peppy one is radicchio. Now, some people find its bite a little too much. I happen to like it. But even if you just put a small number of its beautiful bright red leaves in a salad, you make the salad as delightful visually as it will be to the palate. to try new and unusual flowers in my garden. And one of my greatest discoveries over the years has been the perennial geraniums, like this beautiful purple geranium magnificum spilling out over the edge of this bed. It's well named, don't you think? Now, when you think of the word geranium, you probably don't picture a plant like this. You picture the annual geraniums that look like this. These are actually pelargoniums, botanically speaking, and a very different plant from these perennials. But these are marvelous. There's so many different ones. There's this lovely geranium scenarium over here with the dark purple centers and the streaky petals. And this one over here is geranium macrorhizum, a spreading, creeping one that leaves those wonderful little uh, pinkish pod-like things, even after the flowers have faded. And here's a pretty one. It's uh, got very finely toothed foliage and white flowers, geranium sanguinium album. There's also a purpley magenta form of this plant. And here's another geranium sanguinium variety. This variety is called Lancastriense. It has pale pink flowers on a creeping ground cover-like plant. Now, most of the perennial geraniums bloom in the early summer for a few weeks. The nice thing about Lancastriense is that it'll send out a few flowers all summer long. Now, these are very easy plants to grow. They like sun, they like part shade. It's always nice to find plants that like part shade. All they demand is good drainage, reasonably fertile soil. And there's so many you can try. I still have many I haven't tried yet. The fog-bound coast of Maine, where I live, is hardly a center of sweet potato growing. And that's not surprising, because sweet potatoes require a really warm climate. And around here, we'll have many summers when a warm day might only get to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I'm gonna successfully grow sweet potatoes, I want to get all the warmth for them that I possibly can. I started by choosing a site on a hillside here. That's south, the sun bakes in and warms this more than it would if it were flat land. My second step was to make sure that I had a spot with sandy soil rather than clay soil, because sandy soil warms up so much better. And then I added two extra factors. I covered the soil with this black infrared transmitting plastic. That is a plastic that lets the sun rays through to warm it, but doesn't let light rays through so weeds can grow under it. And it really does a great job of warming the soil. One important step. And then I covered them to protect them up above with what's called slitted row cover. It has slits here to let air in so they can't get too warm in there, but keeps the warmth of the sun in here so on my foggy main days, it's still 10 or 20 degrees warmer in here, and early in the season, I think my sweet potatoes are off to a pretty good start. They have a moist soil under the black plastic and also a warm one. They have a warm site, and they have a cover over them to retain that warmth as much as possible. Sometimes vegetables are unusual because you grow them in conditions under which they don't normally grow. And that's the case with growing watercress in the garden. Now, I'd tried watercress in my little stream. That's where it normally grows. Only here, our soil is so acid and the water so acid that I could never get it to do well. 
And it wasn't until I stumbled across this wonderful little book in a used bookstore that I began a new career of growing it without a stream. This is called The Home Culture of Watercress by Shirley Hibbard, and it was published in 1878. And Shirley Hibbard was very imaginative because she tells in here how to grow watercress without a stream in tubs, in flats, and in cold frames. And she explains that her inspiration came from one day when a friend about to sit down to a salad with her homegrown watercress in it said to her, is your brook quite free from pollution? And Shirley Hibbard thought, oh my gosh, I really don't know. And from that point, she determined that she was going to learn how to grow watercress without a flowing brook. And she has wonderful information in here. And I took her information last winter. We started seeds and flats, put them in our greenhouse where they had the low light of winter and cool weather, and they did absolutely wonderfully. And so this spring, I was even more inspired. I said, gee, I wonder if I can do this in the garden. So I thought, OK, what are the conditions that work well in the greenhouse? Well. The sunlight was low because it was winter, so I'm going to use some shade cloth. And I noticed that the roots of the plants tended to grow very near the surface of the soil, little white roots. And I thought, well, they really ought to be mulched. And the mulch ought to be something white because I want to reflect away the sunlight. I don't want to heat it up anymore. It ought to be something that covers the soil effectively without encouraging insects to live in it, so stones were perfect. And ideally, it would be something calcareous, that is, something with calcium in it, because those are the conditions watercress likes best. So I use these marble chips. And I won't claim that I have the secret yet to growing watercress in the home garden, but this isn't looking bad. I'm getting nice, long stems on here. It's pretty good eating, although in the heat of summer, it tends to be a shade bitey, unless you're a real watercress devotee as I am. So I thought, all right, maybe we can do it even more simply. And Shirley Hibbert had more ideas on that, too. I have my little started plants here in the flats. Started them in little soil blocks, moved them onto these, and believe it or not, these are only two weeks old, and these are three weeks old. And at this stage, they are tender and delicious. None of the heat of summer has gotten into the leaves. So this isn't a bad system at all. Start a new flat every week or so, and when they get about yay high, maybe after four weeks, just snip them off as you would if you were growing sprouts. And by this simple method, you can have a supply of watercress all year long, no brook, no stream, no worry about pollution, and some really excellent eating. This is the experimental trial I set up to compare the effect of different planting dates and amounts of vernalization on the yield of annual artichokes. And thus far, the ones I planted earliest and that had the most vernalization are bearing first. And you know, the real delight in growing unusual vegetables is the joy you have when you're doing something that was supposedly impossible and actually works. And the next time somebody says, oh, you can't grow that here, can you? You say, you sure can. And that is obviously the case with annual artichokes. Look at this. They're starting to come. There are three other, excuse me, four other buds on this plant. This is going to be a very productive patch. And we will get to eat artichokes from now, which is about the third week in July, for about two months. Artichokes fresh and homegrown right in the garden. Now, let me give you one secret on how to harvest them. These won't get quite as big as the extra big artichokes that come from perennial plants, because these are smaller annual plants, and you have to remember that. And so if you wait too long thinking they're going to get really big, you'll be disappointed, because what will happen is when they get as big as they're going to get, then they start getting old, and the outer leaves start bending outwards like that. And when that happens to an artichoke, the base of it begins to get tough. So if you're growing annual artichokes, Cut them just a little younger than you might want to, and you'll have them at their tenderest and tastiest. So when I'm ready to cut it, I'm just going to come right in under the stem and cut that off right there. I think I'm going to get a couple of these for dinner. This is my weekly salad planting. I do carrots and radish and lettuce and other things. But once the weather gets warm, and I can no longer do spinach successfully, I shift and I do purslane. Purslane, you say, isn't that a weed? Yes, it is. And it's either very closely related or the exact same thing as the garden weed purslane that most gardeners know and that I go around weeding out of the garden. But the thing that has impressed me is an article I've read recently in a garden magazine that was entitled Eat Your Weedies. And it was suggesting that many of these weeds are more nutritious than we can believe. And topping the list is purslane. 
Now, this is a cultivated purslane called gold gelber or golden purslane. You can buy seeds for it and you can plant it. And the reason you want to do that is because of its nutritional content. Purslane is high in all the antioxidants, that's vitamins A, C, and E, and is also very high in the omega-3 fatty acids, something that cannot be said for many vegetable plants. It's almost a powerhouse of all those things that the doctors are telling you are good for you. Now, I've often eaten the weed purslane, but with my attitude toward weeds, I'll have to admit that I still weed it out of the garden whenever I see it. So I'm much happier planting the cultivated version, which is even tastier, which is even more succulent and delicious than the weed. And now I have a new vegetable in the garden, but one I can really feel noble about because I mean, this is one of the best weeds, vegetables, whatever you want to call it. It's new, it's different, and it's delicious. Garden sorrel is an unusual vegetable for a couple of reasons. First off, it's a perennial, and there aren't many perennial vegetables. I usually think of asparagus as the only other one. Yeah, I know rhubarb is a perennial, but everybody thinks of that as a fruit. And the other reason is that mainly for many people, this is a weed. Oh yeah, I know that. Sorrel, sourgrass, lemongrass, that's a terrible weed. Well, this actually is that weed, hopefully that weed isn't this big in your garden, that the French, who are so good at breeding weeds into delicious vegetables, have turned into one of the most productive vegetables you can have in your garden. This plant, if I cut it back down to the ground, will grow back up like this many, many times during the season. Now, this is enormously productive and enormously delicious. It has that same lemon taste that the sorrel has, that nice little piquancy. Barbara and I always put leaves of this into salads, giving a wonderful little sense of uh, just the right amount of bite use them around fish dishes, and practically every good cookbook will have a recipe for sorrel soup. Now that requires a huge amount of these leaves, which is why it's good that the plant is so productive. When the time comes to plant more sorrel, you don't have to plant it. This, remember, is a perennial. You seeded it once, from now on you divide it just the same way you would divide perennials in your flower garden. So in order to divide it, you want to cut off all the leaves, you just take a knife, and come right along through here. Same way you would if you were getting ready to divide a perennial. Get rid of those leaves and any other that may be lying around here. And then either take a knife or your spade, depending on what sort of soil you have. You're just going to quarter this plant. On this nice soil, I think I can do it with the knife. Just cut it into quarters. And each one of these quarters I will now move over to the part of the garden where I'm going to grow sorrel for next year's crop. Now, I have a bunch of sorrel plants here. I chose this one for a specific reason. Since it's a perennial and I'm dividing it, I get to choose which one of these plants is putting out the nicest looking leaves, something I want to focus on. This was the winner. And so now I'm ready to dig it up, move it on, and have a whole nother year of delicious production from this weed that has become one of my favorite vegetables. Well, the growing season is over, and I have put away all that plastic cover and metal hoops I had over these sweet potatoes so I can use it again next year, and now there's nothing left to do but harvest. And, golly, that's pretty nice. Here we are in Maine, and we're getting a pretty spectacular sweet potato harvest. We've eaten some of these. They've turned out to be delicious. I've never grown them down south, so I don't know what to expect, but I'm not at all disappointed. The only problem we've had, and you can see that on some of these, is that we've had some longitudinal splitting on them. And if it were a crop I were familiar with, I would think that that had something to do with moisture or growing condition stress. And so I called some friends down south and asked them, and they said, yes, most likely it had something to do with that. But even more so, the variety we chose, Georgia Jet, is a very quick growing variety and would be extra susceptible to any stresses during its growing season. And their recommendation was we might be happier next year with one called Beauregard. Well, this has certainly been successful as far as I'm concerned. So next year, Beauregard, it will be.
It's the end of the season and time to give the final report on the great artichokes as an annual crop experiment. And let me just recap for a sec. We use four different planting dates, February 15th, March 15th, April 15th, and May 15th. Because from our experience, we knew that artichokes, in order to work as an annual, needed to be planted early in order to get some cold when they were first set out. Well, the first three plantings worked well, but the May 15th planting over here, our latest, never produced and you can see they never produce because they're still big green and healthy plants they haven't worn themselves out producing artichokes and this backs up some research that recently came out from the middle of the country down in virginia where they found the same thing that you need to plant them early enough to get them cold and i would suggest that you plant them about the time you start your indoor tomatoes and when your artichokes are six weeks old set them out in the cool spring that will give them the trigger they need now our yields varied between ones about this size, about the biggest we got, which are in the medium to medium large category commercially, down to little ones like this. that were no loss, you couldn't sell them, but boy, they were tender inside. The whole choke was edible because it hadn't gotten fuzzy yet. And these were really spectacular eating. But whether you're going to eat them or forget to harvest them and just be able to look at them, remember these are thistles and they're pretty, I definitely recommend that you try artichokes as an annual crop. Okay, Elliot, how many more plants does Sturdivant think we can grow? Well, in total in here, he lists 2,800.